Nearly 70,000 Americans die each year from drug overdoses, mostly from opioids. As 60 Minutes has reported, the explosion in both the demand and supply of pharmaceutical opioids began with the aggressive marketing of narcotics to treat chronic pain. Tonight, we reveal the story of the powerfully addictive, fast-acting opioid fentanyl. Our year-long investigation, which concluded just as the coronavirus was spreading, uncovered the playbook of sales practices that triggered an explosion of prescriptions. We will introduce you to two insiders on different sides of the law, a top opioid salesman whose rise and fall spanned the epidemic. But first, federal agent Greg Tremalio, who in 2003 saw the crisis coming and tried to stop it. The story will continue in a moment. If you're going to intentionally, knowingly break the law, your profits have to be so significant that when the FDA comes knocking and they hit you with a $425 million penalty, you're still smiling. You're sad in front of them, but when you walk out the door, you're smiling. You're smiling because you just made a billion dollars worth of profit. And it's worth it to them. It's worth it. When Greg Tremalio looks back at the carnage caused by the rise in the use and abuse of opioids, one early case sticks in his mind. In 2003, he was the senior special agent assigned to the undercover arm of the Food and Drug Administration's D.C. Office of Criminal Investigations. His target? Cephalon, one of several drug companies doing business in ways that brazenly flouted FDA regulations. They weren't afraid of the FDA? Why would they be? Back then, you only received a misdemeanor. Nobody was prosecuted. So they're willing to take that slap on the wrist because the benefits are so great. Yes. Profits are too big. Way too big. At the time when a drug company was caught violating FDA regulations, Federal prosecutors typically would negotiate corporate settlement agreements without holding individual pharmaceutical executives accountable. But Agent Greg Tremalio hoped this time would be different. His investigation revealed Cephalon was violating strict FDA laws on drug promotion with three drugs, including a synthetic opioid, Actiq, a dangerous, fast-acting fentanyl, sold in lollipop form for easy absorption through the mouth. The drug is 100 times more powerful than morphine, intended for severe cancer pain only. These drugs are so powerful that they received approval by FDA for their indicated use, which was strictly for cancer patients with severe pain that have a tolerance level to other opioids. So morphine's not working for them anymore. And they're in, still in severe pain, and they need something that's going to give them a recovery immediately. That's what this lollipop is. For people in end-stage cancer? Yes. A doctor can prescribe things off-label. So what was wrong with what they were doing? Yeah, in the, in the FDA, we call that the practice of medicine. We give medical doctors the ability to prescribe whatever they think is going to help treat their patients. But that's with the understanding that the medical doctor is getting presented with accurate factual information from the drug sales rep. They're not being groomed to promote drugs off-label. The FDA-approved labeling for Cephalon's fentanyl drug, Actiq, also called the package insert, tells doctors and patients who should take Actiq and how it should be used. The document carries the weight of a legally binding agreement between the FDA and drug companies, limiting how sales reps can promote a drug. Pushing a drug for patient groups not listed on the label, spreading misleading information, or publicizing a potentially deadly drug as less dangerous than FDA evaluations indicate is called off-label promotion, and it's against the law. Profit over patient health, we call it. Doesn't matter what the drug's indicated use is. If I'm a sales rep, I'm hustling it, I'm slinging it as fast as I can. If not for cancer, what else would they be pushing this drug to be used for? Pain is pain. That's their motto. So whether you have a migraine, pop a fentanyl lollipop. 
Whether you have a back injury, take a fentanyl lollipop. It didn't matter. Alec Berlikoff was a star sales representative at Cephalon. He told us he would say almost anything to convince doctors to prescribe Actique on or off label. Before joining Cephalon, he was a standout sales rep at Eli Lilly and Johnson & Johnson. Wherever he worked, he says, the sales tactics were the same. Ignore the FDA's off-label promotion laws. I was taught to forget the patient, to not think about the patient. Take the human aspect out of it. It's like selling widgets. Were you not aware of what these opioids were doing to communities around the country? What is your job? What is your title? Sales. Sell. Do you understand? Either understand or, or pack your bags. What's the key to being a successful salesman in the pharmaceutical, especially the opioid end of the business? The key to success? The less of a conscience you had, the better. 60 Minutes went to court in Oklahoma to get Cephalon's internal documents unsealed, the drug maker's master plan for promoting its powerful drug, Actique, a virtual how-to for breaking federal law. The documents reveal Cephalon's strategy was to broaden the use of the opioid beyond cancer patients with severe pain to the general pain market, including, but not limited, to osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic back pain, migraine headaches. Getting doctors to prescribe the drug off-label was, quote, the most critical component of the Actique tactical plan. They push you right to the line, and if you go to that line every single day, what happens? Eventually, you start to cross the line, and they want you to cross that line. I guess you would have to run through the risks of abuse when you're talking to the doctors about the drugs, but with a wink and a nod? Not even. If you go through training, like me as a young man, um, you drink the Kool-Aid. You drink it like a fire hose. And I'll never forget, you can go as high as you want as long as they're still in pain. The federal investigation of Cephalon began in January 2003, when a sales rep with a troubled conscience got in touch with Greg Tremaglio, telling him Cephalon was pushing its sales team to break the law. To gather hard evidence, Agent Tremaglio got approval from federal prosecutors to wire up the sales rep and conduct a surveillance operation of company employees at this Nevada hotel site of the drug maker's annual sales conference and training sessions. Set it up right out of the hotel room where we managed the source as we wired him up and we sent him in and we listened to the group conversations. You were listening in? We're listening to the techniques of how to train somebody to sell drugs. And they're being encouraged by senior drug reps. I like the way you steered the doctor away from the label and you talked about severe migraine sufferers. How to groom a doctor? Yes. What is your reaction to what you're hearing? I was disgusted. It was just so open, the conversations about disregarding the label and breaking the law. It's almost like a game to a lot of the sales reps. How many doctors do I have under my control and how many prescriptions or what we call scripts, how many are they issuing every single week? Agent Tremaglio recorded days of damning conversations between sales reps providing accounts of their strategies. It sounded to him more like the corrupt tactics of an organized criminal operation. They targeted what we call pill mill doctors first. Do they go visit the doctor to see if he has a glint in his eye and see if he seems willing to play? It starts there. It's, it's a long process. You've got those that are established pill mills, what we call them, pain clinics that the doctors that just had no conscience. And then you had the ones that you're slowly grooming and developing and where they feel comfortable prescribing the drug off-label. The internal Cephalon documents 60 Minutes obtained show just how Cephalon roped in willing or vulnerable physicians. It funded advocacy groups to promote opioids, spread deceptive information about addiction, and offered incentives for doctors to prescribe opioids, including medical education programs, conference junkets, free dining and drinking, and lucrative peer-to-peer -peer speaking engagements. The master plan noted that, quote, these programs generate immediate script impact, 
In other words, they got doctors to write more prescriptions. And if they can't convince you, they have other doctors that they've already paid that they can reach out to. If you don't believe me, hey. Talk to your peer, except they don't tell the doctor, oh, your peer has been to four vacation spots over the last year and we paid him approximately $200,000 or some astronomical consulting fee. It's garbage. It's no different than a bribe. No so different from a bribe. We're just calling it what it is. Instead of bribing doctors, we're calling it educational consulting, medical education program, fancy words. On the street, they just call it something different. What do they call it on the street? It's just a straight hustle. The only difference is they're in a suit and ties when they do their hustle. That's the only difference. When Agent Tremaglio approached other sales reps at the 2003 Cephalon Conference to cooperate as informants, word of the surveillance operation leaked out. After word got out that you were there... All week. ...listening in... ...to their training. They scrambled. Like cockroaches. Literally within 30 minutes, there was probably 100 taxi cabs out front. And we were sitting out our window watching the drug reps running out to get into the cabs to leave. So what happens? Before I even got back to Washington, D.C., my phone was already ringing. It was a senior official in his FDA division who was unaware of the extent of the operation which was authorized by federal prosecutors. Greg Tremaglio told us the official objected to the aggressive investigative procedures. Agent Tremaglio was immediately pulled off the case. My boss did not appreciate that. FDA did not appreciate that. That was a tactic that they were not comfortable with. Why was that? Because it's a white collar case. You can't treat them like a drug cartel. You should treat them differently? With respect, because they're a legitimate pharmaceutical company. They're breaking the law. People are becoming addicted, dying from their practices. Why would the FDA, the government, want to sort of tiptoe around them? The FDA was afraid of the big pharmas. But you were providing them with the proof. I had the proof. Were they duped or were they complicit? I just think they stuck their head in the sand. What were you going for? The kingpin, the head of the snake. The executives at the top of Cephalon. We never got that far. The case ended in 2008 when Cephalon pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor for illegal promotion and paid $425 million in fines and settlements less than a quarter of what Cephalon made in one year. The company was eventually sold for $6.8 billion. Alec Berlikoff found a new job at a company called Insys. That story, when we return. When Alec Berlikoff and former Cephalon sales reps found a new home in 2012 working for a pharmaceutical mogul named John Kapoor, they would rack up huge profits selling Subsys, a new formulation of fentanyl. Like Actique, it was FDA approved for cancer pain only. And on the strength of Subsys sales, Kapoor's company became a Wall Street sensation, one fueled by unbelievable greed and depravity. In the midst of the deadly epidemic, INSYS sales reps got doctors to prescribe opioids for unapproved uses, enticing them with all-expenses-paid visits to strip clubs, fancy dinners, and with money, which federal prosecutors say corrupted the practice of medicine. This time, there would be no settlement. INSYS was targeted as an organized criminal enterprise, and its top executives were prosecuted. The story will continue in a moment. In January, John Kapoor, billionaire entrepreneur and former CEO of Insys Therapeutics, arrived at a federal courthouse in Boston for sentencing. A jury had found him, along with several of his top executives, guilty of racketeering, mail and wire fraud, 
conspiring to recklessly and illegally boost profits from the opioid painkiller Subsys, a fentanyl spray designed to be absorbed under the tongue. Kapoor received five and a half years. His lieutenants received from 12 to 33 months, in part because of the testimony of the government's star witness, Alec Berlikoff, the senior vice president of sales at INSIS, who had pled guilty and cooperated with prosecutors. We talked with Alec Berlikoff with the consent of federal prosecutors before he was sentenced in January, but after he had testified about illegal sales tactics at INSIS, including bribing physicians. The doctors, are they an easy mark? No. Most doctors would throw you out. Absolutely. And the faster you get thrown out, the better. Get thrown out, move on to the next guy, keep going, keep going, keep And eventually somebody is going to stop and talk to you, and you start to wonder why. I'm a sales representative. I'm not a doctor. The doctor is looking at you, and he's saying to himself, what's in it for me? W-I-F-M. We call it the WIFM. The WIFM. WIFM. If they're saying what's in it for me, then you know you've got one on the hook. You got one on the hook. It doesn't mean you're going to be successful, but you're going to figure out real quick that the more you pay that doctor, the more he's going to prescribe. John Kapoor was a pharmaceutical industry success story. He immigrated to the United States from India and, as an executive and investor, made a fortune with a series of drug companies. You, as an entrepreneur, have to have a dream. And then you work with passion to make that dream come true. John Kapoor hired Alec Berlikoff after the salesman regaled him with stories from his days at Cephalon, bribing doctors, he said, paying them for speaking engagements. He pounded the table and he said, that's our next VP of sales. Kapoor asked him to start a similar speaker program at INSIS. I felt like I finally made it to the big leagues. And John Kapoor was asking you to do this? Yes. He wanted me to pay doctors to prescribe substance. I could do that. I've done it before. I can do it again. And you had talked about bribery. Oh, yeah. Use that word. If I think that he's going to be intimidated by the word bribery or that he hasn't been involved in that before on numerous occasions, I'm a fool. Insys would pay some doctors, sales reps called them whales, as much as $125,000 a year in bribes, camouflaged as INSYS speaker program fees. All that Whoa. money caught the attention of federal prosecutors in Boston, Nathaniel Yeager and David Lazarus. These doctors, these whales, were getting paid to speak 40, 50 times a year. So when you think about a speaker, you think of them going to, say, a ballroom, and you have other doctors there, and the speaker gets up and makes a speech about the benefits of this drug. Right. That's not what was going on? No, no. What was going on, they say, was illegal. And the two prosecutors launched what would become the first criminal case to bring pharmaceutical executives to trial for fueling the opioid epidemic. They indicted seven INSYS executives, including CEO John Kapoor and sales vice president Alec Berlikoff. It's not something that people think about, but the reality is that doctors are licensed drug dealers. And the pharmaceutical companies know that. At the heart of the indictment was the INSYS speakers program. And this is what it looked like, posted by one New York doctor on Instagram. It isn't easy being me, hashtag friends. Sales reps hired to recruit doctors for the speakers program didn't need to be experienced pharmaceutical salesmen like Alec Berlikoff, here in this picture he gave us of his management team but it did help if they had charm and sex appeal. They had people whose previous jobs were being a waitress at Hooters, people who worked at strip clubs, camp counselors. Jaeger and Lazarus called the speaker's program a sham. The doctor would just repeatedly invite her friends or his friends. Just a night out paid by INSYS. Right. Rack up a big bar bill and then get a check in the mail for it. Was it that blatant? It was that blatant. The sales staff was taught to look for doctors who might be uh, going through a rough time. And they would literally list what their strengths and weaknesses were, and one of the things they would say is divorced, needs money. Former senior vice president of sales, Alec Berlikoff, says the terms of the bribe were clearly spelled out to the doctor. 
increase the number and dose of prescriptions or the speaker spigot would be turned off. If you don't produce a return on investment of at least two to one via prescriptions of substance, not only will you disappear from the speaker's bureau, but your representative will be gone as well. And you flat out told the doctor this. Yes, one, the more you write, the more you're gonna earn. The more you increase the strength, the more you're gonna earn. And doctor, if you don't like it, we walk away as friends, no big deal. But in the case against John Kapoor, the ROI, return on investment, was a big deal. Kapoor used real-time data from an FDA patient safety program to track the doctors they were bribing, pouring over patient dosages and prescriptions at the sales meeting held every morning, calling out his executives when they missed their targets. He's looking at the chart and he sees perhaps a doctor is not prescribing as much as he thinks he should be. Mm -hmm. How would he react? Well, he would be irate. Within 24 hours, that rep was demanded to be in that doctor's office and basically enforcing that they increase the dose. He was requiring you to push doses higher than the patient actually needed? He made it mandatory that we launch what, what he called an effective dose campaign. And what is that? It's a fancy way of basically saying, let's make sure that the patient will come back and want more. Others might say, let's make sure we get the patients addicted. You're preying on these people. Yeah, because they're desperate. They'll try anything. And they may get relief from substance initially, but we all know what's gonna happen. We know, we've been doing this long enough. We know how it ends. And that is? It ends in addiction, withdrawal, pain, suffering, and even death. And you didn't care about that? Back then, I was numb to that. I was flabbergasted. As the trial approached, Fred Wyshack joined the prosecution team to prepare the racketeering case. He pressured Alec Berlikoff to flip and testify against Kapoor. Best known for bringing down the Boston Mafia and crime boss Whitey Bulger, Wyshack thought he had seen it all, until this, his first pharmaceutical case. And this is coming from a man who's gone after the mob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the mob does have, to some extent, a, a code of conduct, and usually they're only physically harming other bad guys. Um, uh, these people, they didn't care. It wasn't just bad guys who were getting hurt. And what was the impact this criminal activity was having on the consumers, the patients? Most of the patients who received this drug were non-cancer patients. Taking subsists essentially over-medicated them. Uh, it ruined their lives. Many of them lost their jobs. Their families fell apart. Some were hallucinating. Uh, they all became addicted. Teeth falling out, uh, becoming zombie-like as a result of being given a medication this powerful that you don't need. It was very compelling testimony. Um, some of them were showing insurance records that claimed that they had uh, diagnoses that they'd never had and reacted to the fact that I didn't have cancer, I didn't have that diagnosis. Prosecutors called that insurance fraud. INSYS CEO John Kapoor set up a scam to get insurance companies to pay for the drugs that were prescribed. He had INSYS employees pose as doctor's office staff to dupe the insurers. Prosecutors obtained recordings of the calls and played them for the jury. What medication are we speaking of today? This is for sepsis. So they're sitting in a, in a windowless room in Arizona saying, oh, the weather's beautiful here in Houston today, or, oh, it's cold up here in New York. They would outright lie. They would say the patient had cancer when they didn't have cancer. And they knew, they kept track at INSYS of what answers would work with individual insurance companies. INSYS executives prepared a script for call center workers that almost assured the insurance companies would pay. And the patient's diagnosis is for the breakthrough pain, yes. Malignant cancer pain? Yes, ma'am. Nine times out of ten, that drug's getting wow. approved. And, and, and this worked? It worked for years. It helped make INSYS so lucrative that when the company went public in 2013, it became the number one IPO in the country, 
worth more than a billion dollars. In court, prosecutors exposed a culture of greed. To make their case, they played for the jury an in-house company video about titration, a medical technique used to increase a patient's dosage. I think the jury was disgusted when they saw that. I, I know I was disgusted. Insa's sales reps rapping, boasting about doctors under their control, upping patients' dosage of subsis. In costume, the biggest dose, 1,600 micrograms. This was shown to a packed annual sales convention in Arizona in 2015, Woo! ending with a cameo by Alec Berlikoff. I love titration, yeah, that's not a problem. Everybody laughed? I'm sorry to say everybody laughed, yes. The opioid crisis is raging outside the doors, and you're inside joking about it. Yes. We were all desensitized to what was going on. On January 23rd, a federal judge sentenced Alec Berlikoff to 26 months. I'm sorry. Very sorry. And ordered him to turn over the $4.3 million he had made at the company. A dozen doctors were also convicted of crimes in connection with INSIS. The company went bankrupt, and CEO John Kapoor is to report to federal prison in July to begin serving his sentence of five and a half years. As for Wyshack and the federal prosecution team, this case launched a new, tougher approach to corporate crime. I think sometimes white-collar criminals are more dangerous than violent criminals. And more often than not, they get a kid glove treatment. And I think that needs to stop. 